welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and you guys, I am so excited. This is like my early Christmas present. I get to have my friend Ian Lynch, who is the Canadian Kennel Club spokesperson, join us today, and we are going to have an amazing conversation. We're going to talk about how and ways in which we can change the conversation with John Q. Public, with people who maybe don't understand why purebred dogs are a thing and why dog breeders are not Satan and all of that. So welcome, Ian. I am super, super excited to see your smiling face. Oh, always a pleasure to see you, Laura. It's it's so exciting to be here on my favorite podcast. So always a thrill. So much fun. So much fun. Okay. So I we've, we've talked to you before on the podcast, but I don't think we've ever really gotten a full detailed 411. So tell us about Ian. Tell us how you got to be the Canadian Kennel Club spokesperson. All right. So if you go way back, uh, my parents were Irish immigrants and they never had a dog, either one of them. And when I was a kid, I became like so many children, just fascinated with Lady and the Tramp, the movie on the big Yes, on the big squishy VHS copy of it that we had. And I was I was always amazed by it. I loved all the dogs. I loved the diversity of the species. I was very young and we didn't have a dog. And when I was seven years old, my mom, for the first time, let my twin brother and I go one street over to try a bike ramp. And of course, I fell off my bike, wrecked my jaw. And my brother actually ran over me second. So like I hit the ground and then my brother was behind me. So he ran over me with the bike. So like added insult to the injury. And so when, of course, my mom's freaking out. First time she ever let like her seven-year-old go one street over. This happens. She's in the car. My jaw's hanging on by a thread. (laughs) She's screaming and crying. And she goes, what can I do? What do you want? And of course, I use this as my opportunity. And I said, I want an American Cocker Spaniel. So in Canada, we call it. American Cockers. So I was like, this is my chance. If I'm going to get a dog, it's going to be this way. So I said I wanted an American Cocker Spaniel. And that's how it started. I had I had an American Cocker. And then I had um, I had a miniature poodle, I had an English Springer Spaniel, and then another American Cocker. Um, I thought they were, as a kid, I thought they were beautiful. I look back on pictures now. <laughs> you ever do? You look back oh, as yeah. a kid, I thought they were I look back on pictures and I just know too much now, but they were lovely pets and uh, I did obedience with them, children's obedience, just like kind of through the PUC here. And uh, I did agility classes with them and I, I had a great, I had a great time with my dogs always. And then when I got older, I always was, you know, in here in Canada, we had this magazine. It was an annual magazine called Dogs in Canada Annual. And so before the internet came out, it was this big magazine and I would save up my money all summer for it. November 1st, it would come to the pet value. I'd walk down to the pet value and I would get this Dogs in Canada annual. And Laura, I would take this magazine to the beach, to the ski trips. Like by the next November, it was it was in it was in pieces and I I just couldn't get enough of it. And the knowledge and learning about dogs and all the different breeds, I just could never, ever, ever get enough. So I was I was so fascinated my whole life with purebred dogs. And then I became an adult and I went to, uh, I went to university and I went to college uh, for a postgraduate diploma. I became a broadcaster. I was on a bunch of TV shows, including MTV uh, Canada, Much Music Canada. I became a radio host. And when I was uh, about 12 years ago or so, I wanted to get, I was in a place to get a purebred dog and I wanted a really good purebred dog. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to Linda Campbell of Dowling Poodles uh, here in Canada, Mm -hmm. uh, who I just have always admired their dogs. And through the grace of God, I got a, I got a beautiful dog. And the funny thing about getting the Dowling Poodle was when I was a kid, I used to get dogs in Canada annuals and I used to put all the pictures on my walls because I loved these dogs. And I had a picture on my wall in 1995. Um, and it was it was of Allison Alexander mm-hmm. in a red dress holding Darwin Highfluten, who was the number one dog and has all these records to this day. His name was Luton, I believe was his call name. And it's funny because as I get older, I realize that I was making a vision board because now I have a Darwin dog and I'm friends with Allison Alexander and she's the greatest person alive. So it's so funny that like, you know, that you, you hear all this like manifestation stuff and I didn't know what I was doing, but as a kid, I used to always have the picture of the Darwin dog. And I used to tell my parents, I'm going to have a dog just like that one day. 
And uh, here it is. Well, not just. I mean, you know, it's not Luton, but she's wonderful and uh, an amazing dog. So, and you have and then, a Doberman and a Dandy also, don't you? I, I, I don't currently have the Doberman. I have one Dandy now. I lost a Dandy uh, in July. So I have one Dandy. I only have two dogs right now, which oh my seems gosh. very... It seems very, very low. It's one of those things where if you've ever gone down in numbers, so I, like this time last year I had four, and now I have two, it's more manageable, but you miss the chaos in such a weird way that like, you know, like, you know, when, when everything's going crazy, you think to yourself, you're all like, oh, one day maybe I won't have this much chaos in the house. And then it goes and you miss it, right? So Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I just, down to, I'm down to one adult wire hair, one wire hair puppy and a chihuahua. <laughs> and a part-time got- Spinoni. <laughs> oh, it. wow. That it's seems very low for you. Very strange. I mean, I was a handler. I normally had 15 to 20 dogs. I just don't yeah. even know. Like, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> well, the other day, I was holding a coffee and an umbrella while walking my dogs. And I thought, look at this luxury. You know, I'm like, I only have two of them right now. Look at these free hands. I'm holding stuff. I could never do that with the four. I, I, it was yeah. like, I was doing double Dutch all the time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So you get the poodle and, and, and you bring all of this amazing background to your role with CKC. So talk a little bit about that. So the CKC, what happened was I was trying to, when I was a child, I used to, of course, watch Westminster with my dad. And we would go to two dog shows a year, uh, one in October and one in like early February. And now that I'm an adult and, you know, know where the dog show is, it must have been the London Canine Association and Woodstock, you know, it, it, here in Ontario. So those were the shows I went to. And you have to keep in mind that like in the 90s, how large and for a, a small child, how large a dog show was. I mean, these dog shows in Ontario at the time would have, you know, 25 boxers in a ring, 40 boxers in a ring. They'd have a whole rare breed show. This is before everyone was buying things online. So there was also the, like the merch would be they need a whole haul just to sell stuff and you could get stuff. So I would go to dog shows and I loved it. So um, when I was, you know, an adult and working at Much Music MTV and had access to a car and I had my Dowling Poodle, who wasn't, she was a retired show dog. I wasn't going to show her, but I wanted to go to a dog show. So I reached out to the former executive director of the CKC, Lance Novak. And I just, I said to him, I'm really having a hard time figuring out your calendar of events on your website. Can you tell me if there's any dog shows happening in the GTA or in Southwestern Ontario soon? And then he wrote back to me and he says, are you looking for any work? And I said, oh, and he said, well, you have a good background and you know social media and we're just kind of looking for someone for a six week kind of contract, independent contract position um, to, to you know, kind of help us with our Facebook and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, sure. I'd love to help. I love dogs. Let's do it. And that was um, in February. It'll be nine years ago. So yeah. <laughs> I never left. So it was really great. And I was doing, I, I've done a lot of stuff with the, with the Canadian Kennel Club. It's, it's such a joy to work with them. Um, I did social media. I started blogging, uh, which has been great. I've written over 100 blogs for the Canadian Kennel Club. And then I started doing videos um, this past year in 2023. And that was great. We got to do go out to breeders' houses. And mm-hmm. I, got to, I got to use a producer who's actually a handler herself, Mariah Lara. So I loved the idea of making dog videos by dog people with dog people I know and love produced by dog people, like kind of keeping it all in the family. Yes. So that has been amazing. And then I started common. What happened was in 2019, Will Alexander, of course, professional handler, um, and Cindy, um, Cherry. So her dad is Don Cherry who, and she runs some type of pet, um, uh, charity. And so myself, Will Alexander, one of Canada's very top handlers and uh, Cindy Cherry from Animal Rescue were all together at the Pet Expo one year and we were having a conversation. And I noticed because of my background in stand up comedy, I noticed that the dog show was going on and we were having this conversation. And when the conversation kind of like stopped for a moment, we were losing the audience. So I just, with my instincts, kind of jumped up and just started introducing the best of breed winners, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the Saluki, sometimes known as a Persian Greyhound, you know, doing, you know, this dog is built for the hunt, kind of explaining to people why the dogs look different and how a dog show works and how, you know, 
the the judge is not judging the dachshund to the boxer, but instead to a breed standard, and right. they are judging the individual specimen in front of them to the blueprint of perfection. Not all, you know, no dog is perfect, but some come closer to others, and it's the judge's duty to figure out which one comes closest today. Basically explaining how the dog show works. And I noticed that as soon as I started talking to the audience and explaining the dog show, they were sticking around. Because I would I would compare it to if I was watching a cricket match, if you're not saying anything to me, I got five minutes max in me, right? But if someone's explaining to me this is what they're doing and this is why they're doing it, all of a sudden, you know, I can see lights go off, right? This is why they're moving the dogs around. This is why they're doing a down and back. This is what a stat way. This is why the Portuguese water dog is groomed this way. So I really, I just kind of I just did it off the top of my head and then the pet expo liked it. And you know, you know how it is in the dog world, Laura, if you do something well once. <laughs> you do it well once, do it badly once. Okay. So each one has its own repercussions. <laughs> exactly. But so I keep on getting asked to do this again, and it's it's such a joy to me. And um, you know, I I I love doing it. I love introducing the public to dogs. So we did it at the Pet Expo. We did it at the Royal Fair um, last year, and we did a Meet the Breeds event again this year. Mm -hmm. So I organized a bunch of um, breed clubs to come, and the Meet the Breeds event is so much fun because right. you know there can be drama in the dog show world, as you know. But when everyone's just coming with their dogs to get together and showcase their breed and to let the public come and meet and have these lasting impressions, you know, mm -hmm. and these connections that are, you know, are being made between dogs and people. And they can compare, you know, the greater Swiss mountain dog to the Bedlington Terrier, you know, over to the pug. And it's such a joy to be able to let the public come and do that. And then because we didn't have a dog show at the Royal this year, I didn't know how many people loved the dog show. How many families came up to me and says, where's your dog show? Are you gonna commentate the dog show? And it, it was so moving to me because in the GTA, the greater Toronto area, um, the Royal Fair has been going on since the 1800s. So over I, could, years. I was there with you last year and I was blown away by how many people were there, even at like tail end of COVID, right? Oh, like, it was huge. You have, to, you have to remember how many people come to the Royal. And that's why it was so, it was so crucial to have a dog show there. And we had shows we had credit valley and we had the old new york show and i was commentating the shows and it was such a moment because tens of thousands of children yeah. go from grade one till grade 12 every year to the royal in that area and if you think if they can meet purebred dogs do you meet the breeds go to a dog show these lasting impressions year after year we're gonna make a real difference with these people because the truth is laura you know this and i know this the public's not coming to us we have to go to them and is there an expense to go to the Royal Fair in Toronto? Yes. Is there parking? Is it downtown? Yes. Is it hard? Same with Meet the Breeds at Westminster. Is it hard? Yes. But that was that's that's because it's so important. That's you know, we have to do hard things sometimes to save our breeds. So I mean, or so now I'm all over the place. So with CKC, I'm or, I'm organizing events now and to be out with the public and talking about dogs and sharing my love of purebred dogs and letting my friends in the dog world share their knowledge and love of purebred dogs with the public it's amazing i'm literally i'm so tired november's crazy but like i'm high up you know how you just kind of it's just it's a really happy month for me so so here's my here's my next question you're you're just average joe dog person and you are really worried that and 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 nervous that your friends are gonna give you a hard time because you have purebred dogs. So you you're like a closeted purebred dog person, right? <laughs> like that's how I feel we are at some point. How do we talk to people? How do we come out of the closet? No pun intended about yeah. purebred dogs. The easiest way for me, I think, to start talking to people about purebred dogs is to talk to everyone who has a dog. For example, there's this lady on my street. She has this pit bull mix. If I was to say it's probably pit bull lab box or something. And this dog was so reactive to my dogs all the time. I mean, jumping in midair. And then, you know, I noticed that from a distance, she taught the dog to look at me, you know, the, the treat out. And I stopped her and I said, you know, sorry to bother you. I just want to, you know, congratulate you and let you know that I've noticed how good you're doing with this dog and how far your dog has come. And she says to me, 
Oh my God, thank you. I've always admired your dogs. What kind of dogs are they? What are the little ones? Well, they're dandy in Monteers. Are they show dogs? Where are dog shows? Where can I learn more about these dogs? Simply talking to people about dogs. You know, the way I think a lot of times I'm lucky I have a radio show. I can infuse dogs into, you know, I got the mic, I've got the platform, but we can all infuse dogs into our life at all times. You know, when you have people over, I personally, if people are coming over, my dogs are generally always well groomed and bathed basically weekly, but you want to make sure your dogs look good. If people are coming over, they smell good. They're cuddly. They're, you know, they're, I, I'm a big, I'm a big component of best self and make sure your dogs are their best self when people come over and, you know, people ask questions. Another thing we have to do is when we talk to people about dogs is we have to let people talk as well. We know a lot about dogs. We want to voice our opinions, but we have to let people talk. Here's an example. I have a standard poodle. She's 12. I keep her in a German sporting clip. You wouldn't believe, Laura, how many people come up to me in their 20s and say, I've never seen a real poodle in real life. And if you think about it, with the doodle explosion... This, this this could be. It sounds crazy. It's it, it's it happens more often. And I think people with poodles, especially poodles and trims, must get this all the time. But instead of being like, you know, everything you like about that doodle comes from the poodle, I talk to the people. They say to me, you know, we got a golden doodle, burn a doodle, something, you know, name it doodle. And I always say, Oh, why did you get why did you decide on that? And they'll say, Oh, we like the standard poodle, but we didn't want the grooming. And I say, How's that going for you? You know, <laughs> and they say, you know, well, the dog has to be shaved. The dog sheds, first of all. The dog has to be shaved down every four weeks because the hair basically grows into a knot at all times. And I say, oh, you know, the interesting thing about poodles is they actually have hair, not fur. And, you know, when you mix the hair with the fur, you kind of, they gets this felting kind of action going on. And that's why, here, feel my poodle. You feel that? It's kind of like, it's kind of like hair. And it's, oh, I didn't know that. And did you know that, you know, poodle hair, you can cut it in any sort of way. I've got a photo on my phone. Here's a teddy bear clip for, for poodle. Oh, you know, when people start to get the idea that, you know, that there are other options out there, the truth is people, and I know this, and you know this, Laura, you know, when you want a puppy, you want it yesterday, you know, like right. everyone, nobody wants to wait anymore for anything. You know, we date you know, my generation, like we order food from our phones, we date from our phones, we can do anything from our phones. Why should we have to wait for anything, much less a puppy when Kijiji is selling, you know, all these puppies, you, you have to explain to people, you know, what a breeder is and where you can find a breeder. A lot of people don't know we're hiding it where it's almost as though the purebred people are hiding in the shadows. We have to get out there. I've got a, for the, we have a club in Canada called for the love of purebred dogs. And mm -hmm. all of us have a sticker on the back of our car and people ask me about it all the time. And you know, does this mean you don't like mixed breeds? So like I say, absolutely not. I like all dogs, but what we're doing is trying to preserve uh, the purebred dogs. And what does it mean to preserve? Well, you know, we talk about the example of the polar bear versus the brown bear, right? right. These we dogs, talk were about, we talk about tigers, right? Yeah, like, exactly. You know, there's, there's more actual tigers than there are otter hounds, you know, yeah. there's more pandas than there are otter hounds, right? So yeah. helping people do that and so I think I really take to heart and it's something that I recommend all the time. And I personally fail out badly, <laughs> which is, which is being in public with our dogs, right? Yeah. Like go, go do stuff with your dogs, go to Home Depot, you know, oh. take them, take them for a walk in the park on leash, not in a dog park where they're running around crazy. Just go for a walk with your dog. We organize some great people here in my town, in my city. Uh, there's, for some reason, in London, Ontario, there's like 11 dandies. It just kind of worked out that way. Like, there's probably, I don't know, 40 in the country, but there's 11 right. here in, right. in, in, in London, Ontario. And, you know, we get together and we walk in a park. And, you know, one dog's one thing. Two dogs is another thing. Six dandies. Oh, what's this? Well, do you know this is an endangered species? This is interesting. What do you mean it's an endangered species? Well, there's, you know, there's more giant pandas than there are dandy didn't want terriers. Why are they so rare? And then I explain, you know, well, because of uh, World War One and Two, people had to call their stocks. Other breeds, you know, like the Cairn Terrier, the Fox Terrier, the Westie, they were already in Canada, America, South America, Africa, you name it. They're, but the dandy was just in the region and people had to call their stocks. So, you know, and I started explaining some of the history of purebred dogs and how war had so much to do with a lot of purebred dogs dwindling down in numbers. 
I, with you, Laura, I think doing a tour de pure is always the best idea. You know, you get a few friends. It takes no time. I call, <laughs> I've got, we are, we are totally, no, no, we are making a bumper sticker to pure. tour de pure. <laughs> I love it. Pro plan is always advancing with game changing formulas that promote mental sharpness and help extend lives. See what nutrition can do. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. True Panion is revolutionizing medical insurance for pets by providing the best possible experience to our members. And it's not some space age dream, it's happening now. We pay your veterinarian directly while you're checking out and we're the only ones who can, which means you have decisions in seconds and you don't have to wait for reimbursement. So unlike with other providers, you'll keep more money in your pocket. Ask your veterinarian if Trupanion can pay them directly. Because there's pet insurance, and then there's Trupanion. So that's one. Take your dog out. Take your dog out with friends. Take your dog out with many friends, okay? Yeah. Bumper stickers. Love that. Um, what else? Well, you also have to encourage people who have purebred dogs. I mean, it's not uncommon for me to almost get into a car accident pulling over my SUV to yell, where did you get that Berger Picard from? You know, like I just, if I see someone with a purebred dog, I, I have to get out and talk to them. Mm -hmm. I have to let people know that I think it's so incredible that they got a dog from a good breeder. Luckily people like you and I can quickly with an eye more or less usually know uh, if it came from, you know, it's, I'm, I'm constantly talking to people. I'm really outgoing, but believe me, dogs are a social lubricant. You'll be fine. Um, you know, my, my, my friend, Judy Elford has the Samoids, uh, in Ontario here. Mm -hmm. She has a signature look to them. I can look at a smile on a Samoid and know right away if it's one of Judy's I pull over. Did you get that from Vanderbilt Samoids? Yes. Do you know Judy and Blair? Yes. You know, we just, right. we kind of talk about that. You know, where do you live? Oh, I live over there. What parks do you go to? Oh, you know, that kind of talk like that. It's also really fun and lucky for me that I'm an influencer with a with a pet uh, with a pet store here called Rems Pets. So I can also tell people use this code for ten dollars off your next purchase. The nearest Rems is here. So I'm also giving them a monetary value. But right. you know, the the stopping and talking to people, the letting people know you appreciate what they have at the end of their leash. You know, I, the other day I saw a man with a really nicely bred Labrador, and I said, "Wow, nice to see a well bred Lab." where did you get it from? You know, talking like this, what, what are you up to? You know, are you, have you enrolled in a, in a puppy kindergarten class? I know a great one, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of being out there and willing to help and being someone who encourages other people who have purebred dogs, who compliments other people and who, you know, is willing if they, you know, I'm on Facebook with everyone and I'm on a neighborhood Facebook page and I kind of, you know, will let people know when, a, you know, dog events are going on or my influencer codes are going on. You, you have to be a constant, I think, ambassador and, you know, a good neighbor as well. And on that note, too, your dog should be well behaved in public as well. Right. If you're going to run around try, and talk try, it. try to not be the rabble rouser. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I think that's really important, you know, in that we, we show a good face to the public. And when we talk to people who have if you will, drank the Kool-Aid and believe that breeding dogs is a horrible, horrible thing to do. Um, what are some of your kind of key phrases? I mean, it's a, it's a generational thing. I know it exists in Canada just as much as it does here. What are some of the things that you can talk to your peers and, and young people and, and really, you know, get that message maybe at least for them to think about it? Well, there's a, every every conversation is different, but for the most part, I'm very strong about encouraging people to shop smartly and to adopt smartly. Mm -hmm. um, I explain that a lot of times that you know the the difference between the animal rescue people and the preservation accountable purebred dog people mm -hmm. is kind of like the war in Ireland, the civil war in Ireland. We basically all want the same things. We've just somehow ended up on the opposite sides, right? So we both, want, mm -hmm. we both want, you know, we want lifelong homes for healthy, happy dogs. We both want this. There's no rescue who would say they don't want that. There's no purebred dog person who would say they don't want that. And then I explain, here's 
who the enemy is. Here's what a bad breeder is. A bad breeder is someone who's running a puppy mill, who's breeding doodle mixes constantly and always has dogs available and isn't health testing their dogs and doesn't take your name or number when you buy a dog and asks you to meet them in a parking lot and this, that, and the other thing. And then I explain, well, each and every dog that is brought in to this world by a purebred dog person is done is it's brought in here on purpose into this world on purpose they are health tested they are selectively bred usually there's a list of people who've been waiting for puppies who's going to get them the puppy will never go to a shelter the puppy will be taken back and you know every single breeder has stories and every good breeder i know i don't know of one who hasn't taken back an 11 year old dog you know and at, at any time you know it's the whelping box you know to the grave. Yep. They, will, they will take them, they will move mountains. Um, one of my breeders and who I, I love, a mentor of mine, Mike McBeth from Blom's yes. Candy Denmark Terriers. She's, you should see this woman. This woman could rule the world. This woman, like if someone in Scotland has a dandy and it's the wrong place, she makes it happen that the, someone goes in there and if say an owner passes away or something like that, that the dandy's in good hands. Mm -hmm. um, because I explained that these dogs are so loved before they're even born and so cared for till the day they they die and far beyond it, mm. people ex understand that. The worst thing we can do is start shouting and getting all worked up about it. When someone comes to me with the adopt don't shop thing, I will ask them, "What does that mean to you?" And right. like again, right. the do people and people come to me, let them talk, let them explain themselves, and calmly let them know the difference and say, I can, and right away, I always say too, I can tell you love dogs a lot. I do too. And then you talk Good. because you let like them know that. because there's an emotion there, right? I can tell you love dogs a lot. I do too. And I can tell you want dogs in good homes and I do too. Yeah. And let's, let's work together towards this. Another really important thing that I do is I'm a part of the conversation. We have a really reputable animal rescue come on my radio show. And because I'm there and I monitor the conversation, I make sure it said, you know, a reputable rescue, a reputable breeder. You know, you're, if, if your dog, you know, has a breeder, use them as 24 seven tech support. That's the great thing about buying from a breeder. And if you don't make sure you go to a good rescue because they're going to have the resources as well that someone who buys from a purebred dog breeder would normally have. I do charity work and uh, fundraising with my local humane society. Why? Because I obviously care about animals, but also I want to be a part of the conversation. There's going to, if, if, if I'm there, Ian Lynch is a purebred dog guy. Ian Lynch is there, the humane society. Ian Lynch is, you know, helping raffle off stuff for dogs and going on social media to make sure this dog gets a home and stuff like that. Well, it shows that a, I care about dogs too. And I'm not, we're not just about money because I don't know who's making money or, elitism or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Right. And if someone adopts a dog from a shelter, a reputable rescue, I'm thrilled for them, you know, and it's, you have to, I think kind of, be present and i know everyone's busy and uh, i have two careers i know how busy it is but you know you have to get out there you have to get your face seen and you have to really really listen before you start barking pardon the pun down someone's throat about like it. Your views and let someone talk and let them know that we are more similar than we are different yeah i i think that's a really great perspective ian and i think one that it you have to stop you know, just stop for a minute and just, okay. And, and if you can come from that perspective, I think you're right. So talk to me, one of the things we were talking about earlier, you have some ideas, some goals, one of which has to do with the Ontario vet school. So talk to me about what yeah. you want to do there. So, um, I know, so basically what I want to do with regards to purebred dogs, I've got, I've got a million goals and this is one I really want to do. And I think maybe in sharing this with you, someone might be able to help me mm -hmm. make this become true. A lot of times from what I understand from friends who've gone to vet school is that the rescue people, the AR people are getting in there and talking to the vet students, which is why you have so many vets who people view as the be all end all for expertise on animals. Mm -hmm. That being said, I would trust or, you know, an experienced dog breeder over a lot of vets, but you know, you know, uh, because they've seen more. We my go opinion, to school but, for a lifetime, not just for eight yeah. years. 
Exactly. I mean, if anything was happening with the dog that I didn't understand and the vet didn't understand, if you think for a second I wouldn't be on the horn with Mike McBeth or Linda Campbell, come on. You know, like I'm like they've seen everything. So I want to get into the vet school and do a course, history of purebred dogs. I want to explain not only the history of purebred dogs and how they've helped humankind and why it's so important to preserve these purebred dogs, you know, and explain where dogs are coming from and why, and the history behind them and why they're so important and the predictability of them, but also explain what a responsible breeder does. Because I think a lot of times if you can get into the vets and explain to them what we're really doing before, you know, and even if the AR people and even if the rescue people who aren't, who are against readers get in there, at least I give some balance to the conversation. In my opinion, and as far as I can see, there's no balance there. So I want to go in to the vet school in Guelph here and I want to talk about the history of purebred dogs, the importance of purebred dogs, the preservation of purebred dogs, and what a preservation breeder really looks like. And, you know, how vets, you know, need to form good relationships with with you know purebred and dog breeders and encourage them to dog get it. breeders are good for their business and i think oh. you know I, I i know you know but we have started um myself and a couple other breeders down here have started doing presentations to vet students at dog shows and inviting the vet students to the dog show and taking it an hour and giving them a quick presentation about all the things of that you're talking about and then taking them out and letting them pet dogs. Because guess what? They started in vet school because they love animals, right? Yeah, so exactly. if you can let them see firsthand what that's actually about. And the thing, the other thing that I've noticed is when we have these conversations with the vet students, and I've done two or three of them now, um, you know, we ask them, so who's who's considering a theriogenology, you know, a, a reproductive yeah. focus? Or if there's a hand, it's like this back here where my friends won't see it. We have to have veterinarians who are willing to work with breeders. They are for fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer and further it's between. It's scary. Mm -hmm. It's scary yeah. how few breeders there are. One around here just retired and, mm -hmm. you know, the screams you could hear. <laughs> This is great. And that's what I'm going to say as well. And I think uh, when talking about breeders and all that kind of education for the vets, they really need to know that there is a big need for repro vets. And you'd be surprised how many vets have their own practice and don't really know a lot about, yep. about bringing puppies into the world. Yep. And that's, I mean, that's just the thing. I mean, I, there are some breeders who are veterinarians, you know, veterinarians that are breeders, but they are, again, few and far between. And the average veterinarian, unless they have taken some sort of emphasis in, in theriogenology, you know, they might have the basics of how long it takes a, a you know, how long a bitch is in season and how long a gestation is, but that's about all they got. Yeah. And so it's, and there has been an enormous amount of influence from the AR people, from the shelter medicine world. Um, you know, most of the kids that I've talked to, you say shelter medicine and you're like, yeah, yeah, that's definitely what I'm doing. I'm like, okay, okay, that's great. I love that. We need to take care of dogs in shelters, but you know, there's a whole other end of this conversation. So I think that that's really, really important. And I know the American Kennel Club has put a lot of time and effort into it. So you and I can talk more because for sure, that's something that if you can do it, do it. I think it's imperative. I would love to. I would really love to. I think, you know, like I said, people go, people go to vets and people look to vets. And we have to make sure that our vets, regardless of what their opinions are, have a balanced amount of knowledge on both and at least know the truth. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, Ian, it is great to have you come and visit me in my little office today by the virtue of technology. I love it. You have a fabulous holiday and hopefully I'll get to see you down the road pretty soon. Can't wait.